Johnny Miller, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Before uh, going into the situation where you are, I'd like your take on this the issue of casualties. Uh, von der Leyen took down her video, but she said it, and they haven't resiled from it, that Ukraine has lost 100,000 soldiers in 10 months. I may say that people like Scott Ritter think that's a serious underestimation and that the figure is much more like a quarter of a million once you factor in all the soldiers that are missing, whose mothers and wives are desperately searching for them. But even the 100,000 figure is so horrifyingly large. It's, it's World War II figures. And if Scott Ritter's right, it's World War I figures. If it was a quarter of a million dead in 10 months, that would be World War I figures of casualties. What's your uh, ability to gauge that question from where you are? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm sorry to, to fool yourself, George, and your production crew, but I'm actually a proud Scot from Edinburgh. My accent uh, it makes me sound British. I'm also a proud Brit, but I just wanted to correct that. Uh, and I've also just left Don, Donetsk uh, a week ago. I'm now in Moscow, but I've spent mo uh, mo most of the last six months uh, in Donbass. In terms of your uh, question, for my reporting, I've, I've reported mostly from the Russian side of this conflict. When I started this conflict, I'm asking my news broadcaster to report on the whole conflict, uh, the, the west of Ukraine as well. <clears throat> and at the start of this conflict, I'd have to rely on, on mainstream figures, mainstream journalists, um, from uh, many reporters in the west of Ukraine. I've since stopped doing that because most of their reporting is simply not credible. Uh, I was, you have these missiles landing in Poland, which turned out, they said they were Russian, they turned out to be Ukrainian. I'd have to rely on these sources. And I simply don't anymore. And I rely increasingly on people like Scott Ritter, uh, some other fantastic uh, Twitter and Telegram journalists, citizen journalists, whose information is far more reliable. And indeed, as a journalist covering this war uh, in Ukraine, most of your uh, the research you do is on the Telegram channels. And so uh, the amount of images, the amount of footage I watch, frontline footage uh, of the dead soldiers, uh, it would suggest that uh, the figures that Scott Ritter says, uh, and indeed the head of the European Union says, are much more realistic. Uh, 100,000, I would say, uh, sounds about right or conservative. It's, it's without doubt that the Ukrainians are losing a lot more than the Russians. The Russians, a few uh, months ago, put their figures out about 6,000. They may be lying about that. They may not be. You can double that, by the way, because the Russians only give their official figures you add in the Donbass fighters and the Luhansk fighters and the private military fighters, you could double that to 13,000 or so. That sounds like it might be accurate, although I have spoken to some Russian uh, journalists and figures, and many people in Russia think that it's much higher on the Russian side. But uh, without doubt, the Russians have overwhelming artillery uh, superiority, um, and the Ukrainians, without doubt, are dying in far higher numbers than the Russians. And I suspect the figures uh, of, of 100,000 upward are far more accurate. Now, what's the impact on the morale, on the will to go on with the war uh, in Ukraine in the teeth of such uh, figures? Uh, there's no doubt that the resilience of the Ukrainian forces is greater than many, including me, uh, might have expected, given the rottenness of the regime in Kiev, its illegitimacy, uh, having been born of a, a violent uh, Western-coordinated coup d'etat. Uh, is there any sign, I suppose I'm asking, of any increase in the Ukrainian public's wish to bring this matter to a negotiated close? Well, it's difficult. I mean... It's very difficult to speak about a homogenous group of people. You know, in Britain, 50% of people supported Brexit, 50% people didn't, 50% didn't. In Russia, Vladimir Putin is very popular, but there's 700,000 or so Russians who've left the country. Many have come back. Many Russians are unhappy about the war, although many others. I went to a Scottish Cayley band in Moscow the other day, just returned from the war, and I spoke to the, the Russian singer afterwards, and he, he said, yeah, we're all, um, uh, we realize this war is going to go on, and if I'm mobilized, I will do my patriotic duty. So that's very much the feelings of the Russians. 
The Ukrainians, it's difficult to tell. I have a friend in, in Kiev, uh, pro, a pro-Ukrainian government friend. And, you know, he says, you know, he's living in the dark right now. There's no electricity, but he still says the missile defense is working. There's a huge, which is just absurd. There's a huge amount of propaganda in Ukraine. It's become, I mean, I was in Kiev at the opening stages of the war. I fled for, for my safety. I, any journalist who criticizes the Ukrainian government is the risk of getting arrested or most likely killed. They've banned all political party, most political parties. They've banned opposition media. And one of the most, the most important story that I've been covering over six months, and it's such an important story, George, is that the Ukraine is intentionally shelling and killing uh, citizens in Donetsk that it claims to be its own citizens. Uh, it's, it's such an important story, and there's no mainstream reporters there. And the reason they're not, they're not there, they're not being sent, is because it's a very inconvenient story that Ukraine is intentionally shelling and killing civilians it claims to be its own people. My apartment, three of my apartments have been hit. My favorite cafe has been hit. Whenever I have nothing else, uh, no other filming planned, I simply follow the incoming. Uh, sometimes a missile just lands in the street. Sometimes it's a bus station with bodies in the street. Sometimes it's a youth center with a dead woman outside and, a, and her mother over her screaming and crying to the sky. Uh, these, these people in Donetsk, almost all, all of them are pro-Russian people. And it's a story that's just not reported because if people in Europe realize that Ukraine is intentionally shelling its own civilians and realize that it's not this holier than now democratic country, and they realize that huge areas of the East and the South support Russia and frankly can no longer, I'll tell you what it's like living in a, in a neighborhood where the street next to you is, is bombed, and all the streets next to me are being bombed and there's bodies in the street. These people no one, they, they can't be part of Ukraine anymore. And this story is not being told because the suggestion from NATO no. and the Western countries is that the only way to end this war is to keep pumping money in. There is another way to end this war, and that's to listen to the people on the ground and push for peaceful negotiations. Uh, and that, that's why this story is not being told. I, I, if I had a pound for every journalist that uh, put to me in the run up to the Iraq war that uh, the Iraqi regime, Saddam Hussein, had been bombing his own people, uh, I'd be a rich man. And yet nobody ever says in the Western media that Zelensky is bombing his own people. He's killing his own people. They say that the whole of Ukraine is theirs. Their war aim is to recover all of their national territory, which means that the very people they are killing on a daily basis since 2014 are their own people that they are killing. I wonder if it ever occurs to Western journalists that that used to trip off their tongue in relation to Iraq so easily. Well, well yeah, and I, I, I can't tell you enough, George, or I'll try to transmit to your viewers what it's like um, and just how shocking it is when you're living... The week before I was, I left just last week. Twenty civilians, around twenty civilians, were killed by the shelling. Just indiscriminate shelling. I went to a church. It's very difficult living in these places. There's a beautiful cathedral there. Sometimes I go, I'm spending more time in churches, uh, and I and I and I go there and try to find some peace there. And I think about this cathedral being hit. The next day it was hit, and just a few days ago a, a missile went through the roof and put a hole in its roof. Uh, and it's an incredibly underreported story. And this is why. I, Noam Chomsky, the great Noam Chomsky, and John Pilger, the great Australian journalist, both recently came out and said that there's no war in hit that they've ever seen, that there's been more propaganda than this war. And they've been reporting and, and commenting on war since Vietnam. And you have to ask yourself, why in this war there's been more propaganda than any other war? Why? Because I'm in Moscow now. A lot of Mos uh, Russian people have been damaged by the sanctions, particularly, particularly people in IT, for example, who deal with trade in the West. But most Russians haven't. These sanctions, it must be the stupidest policy in modern European history to sanction a country in Russia. And the sanctions seem to be doing more damage to Europe than they are uh, to Russia. And that's why you need such a level of propaganda in this war to convince the European people to continue to support a war in which they're having to drop their own living standards. And when there is a clearly a peace available, that's why there's so much propaganda in this war. Any serious international analyst or historian knows perfectly well that NATO has played a role in provoking, provoking this war. That's not controversial. That's just very obvious. But anybody who says that is deemed to be some kind of pro-Putin pro or Kremlin propagandist. And the level of propaganda in this war, and that's why you have this huge cover-up of Ukraine 
and of the, the, the extremist Nazi element. My translator in Donbass is a Jew. She's a Jewish woman. She's a translator at a local university. She's shocked. Uh, I asked her, how do you feel about European governments supporting the Azov Battalion who are in Donbass in Mariupol, near where she lives? How do you feel about the Azov Battalion? She says, well, we, we, we as the Jewish community in Donbass, we knew that there were people of this idea who existed, but we were shocked that the European governments would support them. The European governments supporting these people, it's shocking. And there's so many, most European children are taught rightly about the Holocaust at schools. And now when you have this extremism in Ukraine, and it's not just Russian propaganda, there's a huge extremist element in Ukraine. You know, I, I'm a, I don't believe the, Brit the British government has bombed many countries over the last 20 years or so, killed many civilians. But I don't believe the British government as a matter of course daily targets civilians with its bombing. That's what Ukraine does. Uh, and it's shocking these cover-ups. And the level of propaganda in this war is extreme because, because European people are suffering more than the Russian people are suffering. And I think this is a massive, not just immoral mistake from European governments and the British government, but a massive strategic error from the European governments. You know, I'm a leftist. I'm sorry if this offends you, George, or some of your viewers, but frankly, I prefer Margaret Thatcher in power right now, or, or certainly uh, Winston Churchill, who I think would make better strategic decisions uh, for our people than the current lot are, are doing right now. Yeah, very shrewd uh, observation. I agree with it. Uh, the the uh, mobilization of further uh, Russian forces, reinforcements, must be well underway now. Uh, were you conscious of that uh, in the Donbass? Did you see more Russians? Were you conscious of, uh, if you like, a stepping up of the war effort from the Russian side? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, I was in Donbass, what, in May. Uh, now it's very different. Huge amount of Russian soldiers, a lot of Chechen soldiers, uh, the Chechen soldiers aren't quite sure how to respond to me as a British person there. They're quite confused about why I'm there. They keep uh, demanding that I say Akhmat Sila, which is their greeting that they do, but clearly a huge, a huge influx of Russian soldiers. And, you know, I say this that people like Scott Ritter and others, and I think any serious military analyst will make it clear that it's, it's very difficult to see how Ukraine can win this war. Uh, Russia, the, 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 the population, the military industrial complex, it's, it's very difficult to see how Ukraine can beat Russia, even with the Ukrainian weapons. As I said, there are many Russian people unhappy about this war, but the majority of Russian people are supporting this war. And they, the Russians are able to mobilize huge amounts uh, of people. And they have, I spoke to a Russian analyst, pro-Russian analyst the other day, he told me he's been to the east of Russia. The Soviets have been preparing for a war with the whole of NATO, for, 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 for decades, the, the Russians have huge military stockpiles and very advanced weaponry. And it's very difficult to see. And, I, and I'm wondering whether there's just a breakdown of NATO strategy, of whether they actually believe that they can win this war and take back these four regions, or whether they just want the war to carry on as long as possible, make money for arms manufacturers, try forlornly to try to damage Russia as much as possible, even though European people are suffering. I wonder whether they believe their own propaganda and they think they can win this war. Or, uh, or what their strategy is, because it's very clear the Russians will ultimately, it's very difficult to see how the Ukrainians can take back these, these four regions. When Russia, they're not going to cause the breakdown of Russian uh, society, even if Vladimir Putin was ousted. It's more, much more likely that a more hardline uh, president or leader was put in power in Russia. Most Russians are more unhappy. Most, a lot of Russians are saying we should be bombing Ukraine harder. Uh, I spoke to one Russian government official uh, a few days ago who says that we're really holding off, uh, we haven't taken off the gloves yet. Frankly, Russia could destroy cities. Frankly, Russia could give the warning in Kiev to evacuate people and destroy Kiev, and that's without uh, uh, nuclear weapons. The more NATO supplies uh, weapons to Ukraine, simply the more of Ukraine will be destroyed and the more Ukrainian people will die. Uh, and that's the reality of, of, of this war. Now, General Winter is now on the battlefield. What are the climate conditions uh, in the eastern Ukraine right now for those who don't know the country? Well, winter's, winter's tough. Uh, I have one uh, Donbass militia. It's very hard as a British journalist to get access to the Russian army for obvious reasons, but I am able to get access uh, to one uh, Donbass militia. And in the summer, they would take me to the trenches 
the last time they took me, uh, they didn't take me to the trenches. They took me to a non-trench place. I suspect because the trenches are in a pretty bad condition um, because of the rain, the snow, etc. Um, interestingly, when I was there uh, filming, I spoke to a number of Russian volunteers and they all seemed to tell me they thought that they were fighting in the opening stages of World War III. Uh, and that's very much the fear for me at the moment, that this war is going to turn into, or even there's some debates about whether this World War III started in Syria or whether it started in Ukraine. And that's the fear for me. And I think you talk about that a lot, a lot George, about this uh, coming war uh, that, and, and the dangers of that. But the conditions on both sides um, for soldiers in Barmut or Artemovsk in Russian, it's even been the, the Ukrainian or, or NATO media being, call, being called a meat grinder because Russia has overwhelming artillery superiority and is just pounding Ukrainian positions. And now there's another round of Ukrainian mobilizations sending more troops in uh, to get killed by this artillery. So the front lines are difficult. I mean, for Donbass soldiers, uh, many Donbass, there's conscription in Donbass, so many soldiers, young soldiers, very happy to join up, couldn't wait to join up. Some, I, met, I saw one young soldier, he couldn't look more than 18. Frankly, I don't think he wanted to be there. Um, soldiers on both sides um, are dying and it's, and, it's, and it's hell on the front lines. Um, Donetsk City is a front line, effectively, for civilians. Um, but it, it's difficult to explain war to anybody who hasn't been in it. Um, and, and it's... It's, it's hell. And, you know, when I get back to Moscow and people here are just carrying on their lives as normal, just like in London, just like Berlin, just like New York. Um, but in Ukraine, it's hell right now on the front lines in all the cities. And um, I think it's in all interests of European and responsibility of European people to try and stop a war uh, on, our, on our continent. Johnny Miller, stay safe. Enjoy a bit of rest and recreation, we're sure that we'll be hearing from you again someday from somewhere, some other conflict, perhaps. Johnny, thanks uh, for joining us.